Vivichahi Kamehi, Vivichagusalehi Tamehi, secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities. That's the beginning of the Buddhist description of the first jhana, to get the mind into right concentration. You have to seclude your mind from sensuality. This doesn't mean you have to uproot it. Simply that you put sensual thoughts aside. Sensuality and sensual pleasures are not quite the same thing. Sensuality is your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. We like to fantasize about sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. All the narratives that go around lust, the narratives that go around f desire for food, how you want to fix the food, how you want to eat the food, or the great meals you've had in the past. Sensual craving is actually craving to fantasize in sensual matters. The mind has free range. The world itself offers only a limited number of sensual pleasures compared to the huge variety that the mind can think of. And the pleasures themselves and the sensuality are both a challenge in the practice, a challenge in different ways. And you deal with them in different ways as well. Starting with sensual pleasures, the Buddha said, we don't try to weigh ourselves down with pain. We're not here to just to do without. But he said, if you notice that there's a pleasure that when you indulge in it, unskillful qualities increase and skillful qualities decrease, you've got to step back from that pleasure. You've got to deny yourself that pleasure because it's going to be bad for your mind. After all, there are some sensual pleasures that are actually good for the practice. A nice, quiet place, natural surroundings, a harmonious community. These are all kind of sensual pleasures. They're actually very positive aspects of the practice. There are others that will depend on the individual. A good way to test your ability to do without sensual pleasures is to take the eight precepts. I guess the precepts that get added onto the five are basically matters of sensual restraint. The rule against eating in the evening, the eating afternoon, that places some restraint on your tongue. The rule against watching shows places restraint on your eyes, wearing cosmetics and perfumes restraint on your nose. Listening to music, restraint on your ears. Lying on bed so they're not luxurious or high. Restraint on your body. See how you handle that kind of restraint. Some people have real difficulties. Other people find it very easy. This is a typical practice for the Obosita days. The days when in Thailand and other Theravadan countries people take the day off, go to the monastery, spend the day at the monastery meditating. And these precepts are really good for focusing you on where you really need to be focused, which is finding pleasure in, in the concentration. So with sense of pleasure, it's a matter of selective restraint. With sensuality, though, you have to see the drawbacks first. When the Buddha was giving his graduated discourse, a step-by-step -step discourse to get people ready for the Four Noble Truths, that was the turning point. He would start with talk on generosity, and talk on virtue, and talk on heaven. And heaven, of course, would be a description of the pleasures you could have up there based on the fact that you'd been generous and you'd been virtuous. But then the talk would turn. He said, actually, there's a downside to sensuality. He called it not only the drawbacks, but also the degradation, the fact that the mind becomes a slave to its sensuality and doesn't get anything out of it. The Buddha gives lots of images to talk about the drawbacks. First, there's the, there are the examples. 
the kind of sensuality that we have to work, work hard to find the money for sensual pleasures. We gain the money, and who knows if we can actually keep it. And it's because of sensuality that people get into fights. Husband with wife, parents with children, brothers with sisters. And from there it heads out to wars between nations. People commit crimes based on sensuality, and many of them get caught and have to be punished. The canon has a very long and graphic description of punishments. And it's because the mind is overcome with sensuality that it ends up doing things that pull it down, lead to a bad rebirth. Then there are the images of the drawbacks of sensuality. First, the Buddha said, even if it rained gold coins, we would have enough for our sensual pleasures. Our minds are insatiable. Even if there were two mountain ranges the size of the Himalayas, totally gold, wouldn't be enough for one person's sensual desires. So there's never going to be any satisfaction. Then the images of the, the dog chewing on a chain of bones from which all the meat has been removed. Chewing and chewing and chewing, getting no nourishment at all. Just a little bit of taste, the taste of its own saliva. That's what sensual fantasies are, your own saliva, basically. Then if you get attached to particular sensual pleasure, then you're going to have to put yourself in a position where it can be taken away from you. The image of the hawk that has a piece of meat takes off other hawks, crows, kites, take after it to pull the meat away. And if it doesn't let go, it's going to get mangled. Sensuality is like carrying a torch against the wind. You burn yourself with the sensual fantasies. A drop of honey on the blade of a knife. There's a little bit of sweetness, but a lot of danger. So the Buddha has you reflect that if you're devoted to sensual pleasures and you're fascinated with thinking about them, you're putting yourself, yourself in a really weak position. You're going around with borrowed goods, and the owners can take them back at any time. You're in a tree with a lot of fruit, but someone else wants that fruit as well, and they, they're willing to cut the tree down even as you're in it. There are disadvantages all around, both the inside and outside, in a life devoted to sensuality. It's when you can think in those terms that you're willing to find another pleasure. Because the Buddha is not saying simply, when you renounce a practice renunciation you should do without, he provides you with an alternative pleasure. The pleasure of bright concentration, the pleasure of jhana, the absorption you get in when you're fully inhabiting the body, the sense of ease that comes with the breath, the sense of fullness that comes with the breath, and you allow that to spread throughout the whole body. And when you have this alternative pleasure, you learn how to cultivate it enjoy it, and then you use it. We're getting the mind in even deeper concentration. You'll hear people say, watch out for the dangers of jhana. The pleasures are so attractive that you just get sucked in. But the Buddha very rarely talks about the dangers of jhana. There's that one passage where he compares it to having your hand on a branch has some sap. And as long as you're not willing to go beyond the practice of concentration, it's like there being sap on your hand from the branch. You're stuck. But being stuck that way is a minor problem compared to being stuck with sensuality. You actually need the pleasure of Jonathan to get away from sensuality. Otherwise, all you see is two alternatives, sensuality and pain. So to escape the pain, you go for the sensuality. This is without the, the pleasure of right concentration. 
And even though you can see the drawbacks of sensuality, you're still going to go back to sensual pleasures. So you've got to cultivate this sense of well-being inside the pleasure of form, even though it feels very embodied. I know a lot of people say, what's the difference? This feels very sensual. It's different. The sensuality of the body is your tactile sensations. This is something totally inward. It has none of the drawbacks of sensuality. It's not intoxicating. It doesn't require that you do anything unskillful. This is one of the other areas where you have to exercise restraint with sensual pleasures. There are some sensual pleasures that require that you break the precepts in order to get them. You have to say no to those. But there are a lot of sensual pleasures that require that you get into conflict, break the precepts, develop all kinds of unskillful mental attitudes. Sensual pleasures are intoxicating. They certainly don't help you observe your mind with any clarity. Whereas the pleasure of jhana is not intoxicating in that way. It doesn't require anything unskillful. It helps you see your mind very clearly. As the Buddha said, when the mind settles in like this, you can begin to see that the concentration itself is composed of aggregates. You can start using the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. First to pry yourself away from any thoughts of sensuality, any thoughts of any of the hindrances, any of the unskillful qualities, ranging from wrong view up through wrong mindfulness. And then you turn that analysis on the concentration itself. And this leads to another stage. And John Fung talked about this. He was describing one night when he was suffering from really bad headaches for weeks after weeks after weeks, trying all kinds of medicine. Finally he realized the pain was not something to, to try to run away from or to cure. The pain was something to be comprehended. So I sat and watched the pain. And from the way he described the experience, it sounded like stream entry for him. He said one of the realizations that came afterwards said is, once you've been away from the senses, you come back to the senses and you realize just the fact that you are engaging in the experience of the senses is painful in and of itself. Even the pleasures are painful. You open your eyes, pop, and there's stress. Which made me think of that sutta when the Buddha is talking about the the leper. The leper cauterizes his wounds because it feels good. Then his relatives and friends take him to see a doctor, and the doctor is able to cure him of his leprosy. Once he's cured, then he looks back at the other lepers. Does he envy them their burning sticks with which they cauterize their wounds? No, not at all. And if someone were to take him into a pit of burning embers, would he willingly go? No. So why? Well, because the fire is hot, scorching, it's painful to the touch. So the Buddha asks the Magandhya, the person he's talking to, was the fire only becoming painful now that he's been cured, or was it already painful to begin with? It was painful to begin with, simply that the leper had distorted perceptions. The Buddha said it's the same way. Once you've seen the deathless, you begin to realize that even the pleasures of the senses are painful, because you found something so much better. So when you're dealing with sensual pleasures, it's a matter of learning how to exercise proper restraint, restraining yourself from many pleasures that would give rise to more unskillful qualities that would require that you break the precepts. When you're dealing with sensuality, it's a matter of seeing the drawbacks, developing an alternative absorption for the mind, 
getting the mind absorbed in the sense of the body as you feel it from within. And finally, changing your perception of sensuality altogether, so that you no longer miss it. That's when the mind really is free. Up to that point, up to that point, we can be slaves to sensuality to a greater or lesser degree. But it's important that you realize that once you've gone beyond it, you don't miss it. It's not a case of deprivation. We hear the word renunciation, and it sounds like you're being pulled away from your pleasures with often scraps of bread and a little bit of water, prison food. But it's the other way around. You begin to realize that the pleasures and sensuality, those are prison food. The pleasure of John is nourishing food. The image in the can is different types of food, all the way up to ghee, honey, butter. And then there's a point where the mind goes beyond the need even for that kind of food. It's when it no longer needs to feed, that's when it's free.